Welcome all, I'm coming to you from beautiful Boulder, Colorado, and I'll be talking about not using histograms when calculating free energy surfaces uh, when you're doing umbrella sampling using multi-state reweighting. So this is work done in collaboration with myself, Michael Schertz, and Andrew Ferguson at the University of Chicago. If you're interested, check out this paper here that goes into all the details. Uh, so, uh, what does it mean to compute a free energy surface? What is that what we're talking about? Well, sometimes we're interested in the free energy along a single reaction coordinate of interest. It could be a reaction coordinate, just some, or, or a two-dimensional surface that expresses the underlying physical prop, uh, physical uh, quantities in this uh, highly dimensional multiple uh, molecular simulation. So, uh, what we do is we integrate we, we we integrate the Boltzmann factor over the entire configurational space, but we select out only those uh, configurations that are consistent with uh, a value along this lower dimensional space. So we collapse all the probabilities of all the configurations down to this lower dimensional space. And so we'll be integrating over the entire dimensional space, but we, um, for each individual value of our collective variable C, uh, we only include in that partition function, we divide it up among all the different values of C. So we have a, a partition, fun uh, if you integrate the entire thing, it's a partition function, but for each value of this collective variable C, it's only the configurations that, 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 uh, can, that uh, belong to that set. Okay, so uh, now, of course, for finite sampling, we never exactly visit any value of this. And so what we want to be doing is uh, we replace this delta function by some sort of indicator function. Uh, and so we're not multiplying by a delta function, we're multiplying by some indicator function. And it could be just a little bin, it could be a Gaussian, it could be a triangle, it really could be anything. It's just expressing an approximation that locally, uh, in this area of small space around our value of collective variable, we, we observed something there. So we should count that as having the right collective variable. Uh, and so then what we do, we use Monte Carlo or molecular dynamics to sample all of our configuration spaces. And if we're doing it, we're sampling with the Boltzmann distribution. And so we can express, you know, the exponential of our free, uh, min you know, minus, uh, exponential minus Boltzmann weight of free energy surface is simply the sum of all the indicator functions. Uh, and again, this can be any number type of indicator functions that you happen to find convenient. Um, so, of course, if we, we calculate this, if you just let a simulation go, uh, you'll never visit uh, the areas with, uh, with high free energy. You're never going to visit uh, the barriers, but a lot of times that's what you're interested in if you're calculating a reaction coordinate. And so we get no data in the mountainous region. So the solution is, this is a, a tip, there are many solutions, but the most common one by far is to collect data with bias simulations. We force the simulation to go to that area that it's unlikely to visit. We get samples about everywhere that we care about. And then we remove the effect of this bias afterwards. So what we instead have is instead of our, our probability uh, as a function of, of our collective variable, uh, just being a sum of indicator functions, it's a weighted sum of indicator functions. If we had to force the simulation to visit that, then uh, we have to assign it a low weight. Uh, if it goes there naturally, it will have, a, without any bias, it has a high weight. Uh, so there's two steps to this process. We need to determine the weights from the K umbrella uh, functions and then construct the free energy surface with some type of integrator function or something else, some other way to represent it. And I'll, I'll talk about that uh, more as we dig into what it exactly means to have a free energy surface. So those are two different things we need to do. Figure out the weight of each sample and figure out how those weighted samples contribute to a free energy surface. It uh, should be two separate steps. Now the problem is WAM, the most common way of calculating free energy surfaces, um, uh, conflates these two steps. Here, uh, I've got sort of the, the self-consistent uh, equations for WAM. Uh, the indices, there's two separate indices. This is, this is important. I labels the histogram bins right away. Histograms, and that could be problematic because a free energy surface isn't a bunch of boxes. It's uh, some smooth continuous surface. And K labels the bias states. You know, you, you, you bias to your states. You have separate simulations from each bias state. Sometimes you use the same simulation to carry out the bias state, but you know which state it's in. Okay, and uh, n is the counts by bin labeled by bin. Uh, so the variables here, you have P of I, which labels unbiased probability distribution in bin I. Uh, FK labels the free energy difference to bias state K. Each uh, free energy state will, state will have some free energy difference. Uh, and UKI labels the energy of the kth state in the ith bin. 
uh, and NKI labels the number of samples of the case state in the ith bin. Now, the problem here is if you notice here, you assign the same biasing potential everywhere in the bin. Now, this is a problem because maybe your biasing potential uh, is, is relatively uh, narrow, uh, but your bin might be wide. You have to somehow have enough bins that your biasing potential, it doesn't lump all the states in the same biasing potential in the same bin. You have to have enough to have granularity or else you're introducing a lot of bias. Uh, also, you have the same unbiased probability everywhere in the bin, uh, which uh, doesn't make sense as well, because everywhere in the bin, uh, you're using these same bin probabilities to calculate the free energies. So you're lumping everything together in a way that doesn't really make sense. So the better way to do this is to find the weights for each sample and then find the best function consistent with the weights. Uh, so the way uh, we do this, which can be shown to be optimal under many conditions, is use the multi-state Bennett acceptance ratio. We carry out the bias simulations, and then without doing any histogramming, we process and find out what the free energy of each state is. And if we have the free energy of each state, we can calculate the weights associated with each bin, which will just be essentially e to the, the minus free energy of the entire state minus the potential energy, the unbiased potential energy uh, uh, in um, at, at that point. So we can calculate the weight of each of those. Uh, this reduces to the Bennett acceptance ratio for two states or weighted histogram analysis in the limit of the zero width histogram bin. So you can think of it really as uh, shrinking, making the histogram bins really small to determine the weights, but not to determine the free energy surface. Um, yeah, so there's lots of nice properties about uh, Bennett acceptance, uh, about, about WAM. Uh, it's provably the lowest variance reweighting estimator. Okay, so we find the weights, uh, and uh, and then um, uh, so so just as an example of this, direct determinant of the of the weights has some clear advantages for free energy surfaces. So here uh, I've got uh, you know a probability normalized probability density of a propane dihedral angle by umbrella sampling replica exchange, and in one uh, you have relatively coarse spins here, and this is probability not free energy uh, to make it a, a little clearer what's going on. And if you use WAM to determine both your weights and determine the occupancy of each bin, you um, the true values in gray, you underweight the barriers because your average, you're smearing out the free energy over the entire barrier, uh, you're flattening out the peaks. Whereas if you use MBAR for the weights and then just use histogramming to lump the probabilities together, you get something that's much more accurate. And this was uh, done by not our group, other people who, who noticed how much better this approach was earlier. Um, so a better way to think about the, so, so that's the first thing you should do. You can use binning to uh, determine how much probability is in each region of your collective variable, but you really should weight it uh, with the weight uh, determined from the points alone with no binning. So a better way to think about the problem though is what do we actually collect when we simulate? So what we're interested in is calculating some probability as a function of collective variable. And usually that's going to be relatively smooth. If you're looking at the, uh, you know, the radial distribution function of two, uh, pair, uh, distribution function between two atoms, it's a smooth function. Um, you can, I'm sure you can some, come up with some pathological case where that's not, uh, pa place where that's not the case, but usually it's a, it's a continuous variable. Uh, but what we actually get, we don't get continuous variables, we get samples. Where the probability is high, we get more samples, and when the probability is low, we get fewer samples. Uh, now, if, here's an example of replacing this, uh, uh, these, 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 these samples with a kernel density approximation. And if the kernel density is too small, we get something that's very bumpy. It doesn't really quite look like what the real distribution would be. If we uh, have too wide a probability distribution, it looks a little better, but you can see that there's some real errors here. You know, there's more probability than there should be from the original distribution. So what can we do to really interpret this uh, as, as a, a better way to come up with a continuous continuous function that rep best represents what we get from simulations. So um, again, usually we can't just do that. We have to think about the biases as well. So in this case, I've taken my original variable and then I have two other uh, I have bi a, a, a distributions that are biased. So here I've added a harmonic bias at point one that constrains it more to point one. Here in the bottom, I've added a, a harmonic bias that constrains it more to point five. And so you can see that you know between these three distributions, the unbiased distribution, the two biased distributions, we pretty much have sampling everywhere. So we forced it to visit everywhere interesting. Uh, and so when we collect data, what do we get? Well, we'll get something like this. In each bias distribution, we'll get a lot more samples where the bias is applied. And in the unbiased distribution, we'll, you know, we'll get 
again, uh, uh, lots of samples where the probability is high and low sample samples in other places. But overall, we have samples everywhere. OK, so what do we do? Now, the first step, we have to weight each of these observations. So um, we, have our, our, we, we find the weights of each sample using MBAR, and I won't go into all the details there. But what do we get out? This is what we get out. And this is really a fascinating graph, because this contains information about the probability of the collective variable in two ways, both the density uh, captures what's going on with the variable, and the weights do as well. So um, here, over here, you have a little bit lower sampling. So the actual true density, the curve goes a little bit lower than the weight. So it, it's really fascinating to look at what's going on here because it's encoding two types of probability density, both by weights and by a density of sampling. OK, so this is what I would call our empirical distribution. This is uh, what we would imagine we would get if we could sample uh, uh, <clears throat> for a very long time. You know, th this, is, this is the the probability distribution that we have sampled. And, but, but this is not very useful because what we really are interested in is the continuous probability distribution that best expresses this empirical distribution. The continuous probability distribution that is, that is just like a bunch of spikes, right? Uh, the, the, the continuous probability distribution that is closest to this bunch of spikes. So that's what we're interested in. What is the, the, the way we can map between this uh, non-continuous probability distribution and the continuous probability distribution. So uh, how do we generate a contribute continuous distribution close to this thing? So um, there's a lot of ways to, to calculate distance. Uh, one thing that's been particularly useful for us is the Kolbeck-Liebler divergence that expresses the distance between two probability distributions. So that's not quite a distance because it's not symmetric. Uh, if you notice a Q, uh, the, the empirical distribution, it can't be, the, the Q in the denominator cannot be an empirical distribution function because it, um, it, it, it's zero in lots of places. You can't divide by zero. But our a trial continuous probability distribution can. So we can write this, the distance between our empirical distribution and our trial continuous probability distribution is this. We take the ratio of what the empirical distribution would be at the point divided by the trial probability distribution um, multiplied by our empirical distribution. And we just sum that over all the points we've observed. So we, we've turned this distance measurement into a sum over all the observed points. Uh, so that's what we want to do. We want to find the probability distribution that has the smallest distance from the empirical distribution function. It's now an optimization problem in parameters. Uh, and what do we represent the trial distribution by? That's a really good question. Anything we feel that's reasonable. I'll get back to what we mean by reasonable later, but it should be smooth, obviously. Not too many parameters. We could be overfitting. Um, histogram bands, you could use it. The parameter is the bin width. Uh, kernel density estimates might be a little bit better, but, but even back to maybe something like Gaussian uh, mixture models, uh, I'll show mostly data here of splines or the parameters of the values at knots. Uh, not. So we have smooth curves where we can limit the number of, of um, parameters that are involved because it's just the number of, of spline points and their derivatives. Um, this is very similar to the variational free energy perturbation work from Lee and York. It's, it's, it's inspired a lot by what they did. So we, we feel we've improved it a little bit and improved how, that, how it works and, and the performance. Um, it turns out there's also a maximum likelihood interpretation. Uh, uh, you could say, well, I'm interested in uh, the empirical distribution uh, given sets of parameters. So what I uh, do is I say, well, how likely I am to observe these, uh, these weighted points here given um, a, a trial function. Uh, and there, the, the exponent here is really just the weight. It's you know, because the, the lower the weight is, the less frequently you see that. So uh, you, could, you could interpret it as how likely I, uh, would I be to get all these points if I happen to run uh, with a given trial distribution. Um, and uh, uh, the paper talks a little more about all of these, but the, uh, what ends up happening is that the maximum likelihood interpretation is exactly the same as the kolbeck liebler divergence. So they're actually just different ways of thinking about the same thing. Um, there's two different choices for which empirical distribution to use. Uh, this gets a little subtle, so you might need to uh, go to the paper uh, to, to understand this a little bit more. What we could do is reweight all the K uh, umbrella simulations, and uh, then from that single empirical distribution, estimate 
uh, are uh, a free energy surface, the, 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 single dist uh, the single distribution that's closest to that. The other is to find a single continuous free energy surface that best matches all the states simultaneously. So actually what you do is, is take a K, KL, uh, uh, kolbeck liebler divergences, add them together and minimize the sum of those. Uh, and they're actually end, they actually end up having slightly different properties. The second one ends up being a little bit better uh, for reasons that the paper gets into uh, more. So if there's a maximum likelihood interpretation, then there's a Bayesian interpretation as well. Well, right, we have uh, parameters uh, and a data set of samples, and the likelihood there is just the, the 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 likelihood that we just maximized. But we can also add a prior though to allow us to encode things like the smoothness in our model. Aha! This idea of what a reasonable function is. Well, we can put that in the prior. And so it's very important. We can make, we can quantify uh, the choices here. And this in particular uh, uh, was, was done with, with Andy Ferguson because I didn't know my Bayesian inference well enough at this point. Uh, so he uh, uh, provided some great insights here. Uh, and we can uh, take those and get out a, a posterior probability distribution of our parameters. Uh, so uh, we can investigate the uncertainty of methods using Monte uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo and model space. So uh, for the KL divergence to the unbiased state versus the sum of KL divergences to all biased states, you can actually construct confidence intervals. And here's you can see uh, the, the advantage of the, uh, the sum of the KL divergences to all biased states. It gives you even probability everywhere along the free energy surface. Whereas the unbiased state, uh, it turns out that you don't get enough, uh, you don't get good resolution in the barriers, you get good resolution just in uh, the minima, which is not that useful. So it's better to spread out uh, your uncertainty over the entire uh, uh, barrier. So it's, it's nice that you can really quantify the uncertainty in the choices here. Um, yeah, and so this case, uh, we use a prior that's a Gaussian penalty on the difference between spine, uh, spine coefficients uh, such that we favor smooth curves. Uh, and uh, so idea we're trying now that we think could be even more useful. And this is a collaboration with a fantastic uh, graduate student uh, at KTH in Sweden, uh, Annie Westerland, uh, is to use a Gaussian mixture model where we represent our potential mean force or free energy surface as a sum of Gaussians. Um, there's a lot of literature on how to optimize and, and represent ga uh, 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 Gaussian mixture models. We're still working on, on all the details and making it all, uh, fast enough, but we're getting some really cool results out where it's, we seem to be able to match these pretty well. And uh, splines don't work very well in 2D, but uh, Gaussian mixture models do work quite well. So we're still optimizing this, but uh, it should be possible to turn this into two-dimensional free energy surfaces relatively easily. So conclusions here, uh, we have a nice pure formalism for calculating potentials of mean force using reweighting techniques. What do I mean by pure? In that we go directly from an empirical distribution, which is exactly what we observe, and use maximum likelihood and Bayesian inference to encode all the assumptions we put in to make a continuous distribution. Um, we should be looking at continuous potentials of mean force rather than histograms, which have multiple problems, both in binning and in determining the weights if you're using WAM. Uh, this is available for use in PyMBAR uh, 4.0, which uh, should be released this week. You'll have to see. But uh, even if it's not released, uh, th th there's a, a branch that has all of this functionality included already. Thank you so much. And I hope to get questions in chat or an email or some other way that I can provide more information for you. Thank you so much.